Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicole Morin, the biologist in the animal care department, coming to you from the Wild Center of Tupper Lake. And I'm out here today on this finally a gorgeous spring day with some nice weather and it's not too windy out here on Wild Walk, one of our outdoor campus attractions. And I will be talking about some of the most common things we see when we're in the Adirondacks, which are trees. They are fully all around us. We've got six million acres of beautiful forests here in the Adirondack State Park. And so today I figured we could spend a little bit of time talking more about these common trees and how they relate to the rest of the natural world, including some of our wildlife species. So thank you everybody for joining me. Again, uh, I'm Nicole Morin from the Wild Center and today's live stream will be focusing on Adirondack trees. If you guys are following along live, feel free to add your questions into the comments and I'll be sure to answer them um, as I go. If I don't get to your question during the online portion, I'll be sure to circle back and check in at the end of the program. So first off, I'd like to talk about one of our most well-known Adirondack trees. So in New York State, our uh, state trees, actually the sugar maple, which is a deciduous hardwood that is most well known for its maple syrup production that everybody loves. But today I thought we could focus on some other trees that might be a little less well known. Hello everyone, I see some folks are starting to tune in. Um, so I would like to talk about first and foremost the eastern white pine. So I am going to be moving around on Wild Walk and taking you guys with me, so uh, please excuse the jumbles as we move along. But I'd like to again start with the eastern white pine, which is just around the corner here. We've got a lovely egg sample. So we're going to take a little adventure this way. Come into the sunshine here. All right, so it might not stick out from too many of the other trees, but this one behind me with the really bushy looking needles, this is the famous Eastern White Pine. Eastern White Pine have a pretty uh, interesting story here in the Adirondacks. I like to think that they're part of the reason why the Adirondacks um, as a park exists itself. So the White Pine behind me, they are pretty varied as they grow, so their bark looks pretty different over time. But the one way to identify them, and these guys are really common, you're gonna find them um, all up and down the East Coast, is looking more closely at the needles. So I have a sample here. And the best way that I like to identify the white pine is by looking at the individual needles. So you've got multiple needles here on this stem, but each needle is bound in a fascicle. So they're actually kind of in a, like a group put together where they stick onto the, uh, the branch. And if you count the needles in one little fascicle on a white pine, you're gonna find five needles total. So you've got W-H-I-T-E white. So five needles in a fascicle, you've got white pine. That's the best way I tend to identify it other than looking from afar in the general shape. But the eastern white pine, like I said, has a pretty interesting story, and I like to attribute it to some of the, the purpose behind the creation of the Adirondack Park. So many, many, many years ago, uh, logging began in what is now known as the Adirondacks, so the process of removal of trees for lumber uh, in the forestry industry. And that started um, when we were still, I think, the New Netherlands, before we were even named New York. Um, so when that period of time in the early 1800s, um, the Crown Lands passed to the state of New York and they had to, the New York had to discharge war debts from the Revolutionary War. Um, they started letting in lumbermen to come and take down some of the trees because our trees were massive. We had a really nice um, intact forest for the most part in the Adirondacks and white pine were a really predominant species in the area. And they were really, really highly valued for their timber use because I mean, they're awesome. They get absolutely massive. This one behind me is really not that old. There's some of our oldest lived trees here on the East Coast and they get to be absolutely huge. So there are um, p patches of what's called cathedral pines in certain pockets of the Adirondacks. There's one not too, too far from here in Paul Smith, New York, where there are still old growth white pines standing. And they are, again, absolutely massive. I've got a picture here to show you guys. 
little a little one that I took myself uh, a few years back when I went on an adventure to this cathedral pine spot. And if you look in this image, you can see little Nicole down at the bottom uh, trying to wrap my arms around this absolutely massive white pine. So I like to call them the Sequoia of the East. They've certainly earned that name and they're just huge. And the reason why they were so valued for lumber is because not only were they so big, but the trunk itself, the part of the tree that is really wide, that is absolutely straight for the most part. So these trees, the way that they grow, that natural growth pattern of that really straight trunk um, is really valuable for lumber. White pines are actually used often to build ship masts. Again, um, back in the day around the war times, they were used, harvested to create masts and they were, um, again, just really useful and they were cut down pretty quickly. And back then, you know, we didn't really have a lot of the um, practices nowadays that we know are science-based and that help to regenerate for us. So lots of areas were really intensely harvested in the Adirondacks and it wasn't just white pine. We also had, there's another tree kind of just to the side of it, which might be a little hard to see over there and discern amongst all the green, but spruce as well as hemlock, the eastern hemlock, white spruce, red, red spruce, black spruce. Um, all these trees were harvested as well for the paper industry and then hemlock especially for the tanning industry. And so our woodlands were becoming pretty depleted, uh, you know, way back when. And essentially back in like the 1850s or so, um, that's when people started to worry about our harvesting of trees because we started to notice some adverse effects from the um, intensive logging that was going on in the Adirondacks. And believe it or not, here, Tupper Lake, we are known as like the capital of logging in the Adirondacks. The Racket River, um, just off to my side over here, um, if you look over a wild walk down there, that was a logging highway. So you had thousands and thousands of trees being harvested. And eventually what happened is people started noticing um, the soil's decreased ability to hold water as it was eroding away. So we were having flooding problems back then as well. And then this guy, who we really owe it all to, um, Verplank Colvin, fancy name, back in 1872, he was tasked with doing a survey of the Adirondacks um, to see what was out there, what's going on, and what sort of resources were available. So that was back in like 1872. And so he traversed the Adirondacks and um, he really loved the natural area. He was totally taken by the beauty of this land and the resources that we have. And so he took his testimony and his, um, his survey to the state legislature um, to really encourage our state to protect these lands, to continue to preserve them. You know, he knew that if we continue to just have logging um, overrun the area without any sort of constraints or controls, that the Adirondacks, um, its resiliency and its resource ability would be greatly hindered for future generations and also negatively impact the overall environment and the wildlife as well. So the legislature was persuaded by his testimony and in 1885, um, that's when the forest preserve, the Adirondack Forest Preserve, was first created to offer protection to our land here in the Adirondacks. But it took a little bit while longer until the actual Adirondack Park was established. That was established in 1892. And so our trees, our lands won official protection to secure their resource availability in the area and to protect the habitats and ecosystems that are unique to this area. But he desired, or Verplant Colvin, I should say, desired even more and greater protections for the Adirondacks. And so eventually, after the Forest Preserve and the park were created, we had a constitutional convention in New York, and that was in 1894. And that is when our trees, our forests, their rights as, um, as individual organisms, essentially, um, were guaranteed in the New York State Constitution. So our trees on the forest preserve land, the original forest preserve land, which was, I think, less than three million acres. The park now totals about six million acres, but the forest preserve, I believe, was about between two and three million acres originally. So that original forest preserve is 
protected in our Constitution. We won that battle um, to secure the rights of our land. And that is when the clause forever wild came into play. So our forest preserve being forever wild enshrines the protections of our trees and our resources in the Constitution. And it's not very often that that um, really gets overturned. It's really actually difficult to do any sort of forestry management or resource extraction on these public lands or even habitat management for wildlife because of that protection. It takes a massive amount of um, legislative power and it's like two thirds of the state Congress has to vote to allow um, any sort of harvest or removal of trees to be done in the Adirondacks. And so the only times since the, um, the passage of this forever wild clause in 1894, the only times that that was ever um, overturned, quote unquote, was to uh, make the North Way the I-87 Northway, and then to cut trails on Whiteface Mountain um, for the skiing. So the white pine, um, especially that's, I think it's our most characteristic tree. It's the one that I see most out here in the Adirondacks. It really does have an important um, service here for us in the Adirondacks and kind of is a showcases our history here and how the park came to be. So a lot of these big, big, big white pines don't really exist anymore. Um, if I kind of move us over here real quick, we can actually see an artistic rendition of what these trees used to look like. So again, I'm on Wild Walk, our outdoor campus here at the Wild Center. And I am bringing you over to show off my favorite part of the exhibit, our um, recreation of a white pine tree snag. So that's one that you can walk in over there, but that size is only a little bit bigger than what the trees actually were like back in the day. Again, I showed you guys that photo here. I think I have it these trees, these centennial trees, these cathedral pines were absolutely huge. You see, that was me a couple of years ago, hugging a tree who deserved it, of course. Just absolutely massive. And so these trees, you know, they don't just provide um, lumber and resources for us, but they also provide um, wildlife resources as well. The white pine is pretty important for several different species of mammal who are going to, whether it's eat stuff from the cones or chew on their buds, eat the bark or the needles. And that includes like beaver, of course, love munching on white pine trees, porcupines as well, um, gray squirrels, red squirrels, white-tailed deer, all of these animals, um, and even snowshoe hares are going to use the eastern white pine. And it's an important part of the resources that they have available in our forest. And there are many, many songbirds as well that utilize the white pine. Um, one of the most recognizable ones to me is probably the pine grosbeak. Um, that guy gets his name from chewing at pines, um, or well, the cones more specifically. And in upstate New York, not only do the uh, songbirds utilize these trees as well, but there is a species of raptor, a bird of prey that also utilizes these trees, and that is the northern goshawk. The northern goshawk is a really big, formidable bird of prey, and they seem to favor eastern white pines as their nesting spot. So most often you're gonna find their nests, although it's a little hard to find, um, you're gonna find them in white pine trees way up, a nice big nest in there, and the trees provide shelter as well as that nesting spot for them. And so the northern goshawk, I do have a, an image to show you guys what they look like if you haven't seen one. They're really, really unique. Not often found because they actually tend to hunt in the forest. So you might have uh, tuned into other lunchtime lives where you've seen our kestrels, the little falcons on the glove, and those guys really like to be hunting in more open areas like fields and meadows and stuff like that. But this guy, the northern goshawk, hopefully you guys can see that all right, really really beautiful, lovely black and gray coloring. These guys are forest hunters. So the way that their bodies are built is a little bit different. They've got uh, comparatively shorter wings and longer tails to make them more maneuverable through the forest as they fly around um, looking for prey. So these guys, the goshawks, many songbirds and plenty of other mammals really rely on these trees. But the eastern white pine isn't the only tree that we're here to talk about today. There are uh, several other species that are pretty prominent here in the Adirondacks as well. So we're going to take 
a little adventure over here. This guy is just starting to grow. Here we go, can we see that? Yeah, all right. So this guy behind me here is what we call an Eastern larch, or more commonly known around here as the tamarack tree. And these guys, this one here is planted um, around Wild Walk. We have several different species of trees that we planted around this site when it was built. And this tree tends to be found in um, much wetter places like swamps and bogs and stuff like that. They don't mind having their feet wet. So these trees are significantly different than the white pine. If we take a little sample here, we'll look more closely at the needles. So these are little, little baby needles. You can't even really see the separation. But when you look at this fascicle, the individual uh, needle, I don't know if you guys can see it, there we go. Um, it's several, several, several needles all in a whirl around this little fascicle. So it's almost like little puff balls on the end. And they're really, really soft when they're nice and mature. And these trees are um, again, one of the most common species that you're going to find in the wetland because they're capable of tolerating more moist soil conditions and also more acidic conditions. But actually right in front of me is another common site you might see. And this one is a dead tree of unknown sorts. But dead trees, ones that are called snags with these natural cavities, and I'm going to bring you guys around this way. Hopefully you can see some more of the, uh, the holes there along the tree. These cavity trees, these dead trees, provide as much of a function as the living trees do. So these trees, the dead trees, the ones with all the holes, you probably know them as woodpecker trees. Woodpeckers tend to peck out all these holes in the dead and dying trees, looking for insects and that sort of stuff. But Dead trees provide an amazing nesting site for many different species, from flying squirrels to wood ducks to screech owls and kestrels as well. Um, so cavity trees, these are the, the proper name for them, cavity trees, because they have holes in them, um, provide incredibly important nesting sites for animals that require um, a cavity nest. Not all birds um, build nests with sticks, Oftentimes, um, they will nest in cavities, so naturally ho um, hollowed out trees, whether it's by woodpeckers, weathering, disease, fungus, whatever it may be, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And that provides a really important part of the habitat for our animals around here. Now, we do have a couple other trees that I'd like to talk about. I'm gonna head back this way, because I've got a sample over here. Actually, we've got a perfect one right behind me. If I step off to the side, you can see this tree might look a little dead from where you guys are standing with this lighting, but that back there is a paper birch tree, Betula papyrifera. And that's one of the most easily recognizable trees um, that people tend to see. It's got that peeling white bark. Um, you can, you know, if you get a piece of bark that comes off, you draw your name in it with a stick, that sort of thing. Um, but the paper birch also provides important components of habitat as well. All of these trees work together in a forest to serve the needs of our wildlife, especially our songbirds. And right now, the birches, um, they are starting to leaf out. So their buds, I can't reach them right now, um, but their buds are not the only thing on the branch. They also have what's called catkins, which is this, um, it's about the size of my pinky, maybe a little thinner. And that is what produces the pollen from those trees. So oftentimes, like in the spring, everybody gets allergies, right? You're like, oh man, that ragweed, the goldenrod, all those flowers are making my nose run. Well, oftentimes, most people are impacted by pollen from trees and they don't even realize it because all the pollen um, that's coming off the trees, it's way high up. You can't really see it. But I know soon enough, uh, my car, everything's going to be covered in this yellow powder. And that's actually the pollen from the white pines. 
So the pollen that they produce can be, um, it, it, it can come a lot at once. It oftentimes clogs up the shorelines of the sand along lakes. And so it's pretty um, formidable when it comes to your allergies because there's just so much of it, especially around here. But the other tree, which I don't have in close access to me um, from Wild Walk, is the balsam fir. So balsam fir, I've got a sprig here. This one is also pretty easy to identify um, if you get close and look at the needles. So it might be a little hard to see in this picture, but if we look at it from the side, you're going to see that the needles are flat. They come out just from the sides of the twigs. And instead of being all the way around the twigs, like some of the spruces, and this stuff is the kind of holiday smell that brings around those um, Adirondack memories. Oftentimes people use balsam fir to make balsam pillows. You might have sniffed balsam scented candles. This is another really prominent um, tree species here in the Adirondacks. And if you take a look, it might be a little hard to see with the camera, but if you're looking underneath at the underside of the needles, let's see, you're actually, yeah, I don't know if you guys will see it, but there's little lines underneath. There's two little white lines that you can see with your naked eye underneath the needles. And that's the way that I identify balsam fir. Plus you can just crush it up and give it a good old sniff because you certainly won't forget that smell. So the balsam fir also serves wildlife uses as well. It can be a nesting site. And then all these conifers that we've talked about, the white pine, um, the tamaracks, the firs, these guys all produce cones. Um, that's how they reproduce. And the cones, of course, have little seeds on the inside that native songbirds like to pick at and eat. All right, so I do have a question that popped up here. Let me just scroll back a little bit. Ruth is wondering, how long do trees last for the year? So I hope I'm able to answer your question if I'm understanding it properly. Um, the trees that we're looking at, um, even the ones that are evergreen, they're always green, right? The pine trees, the, um, the balsam fir and stuff, they last all year as in they look green and they are continuously having uh, needles on their tree, even in the winter time but they are not actually evergreen. Those needles don't just live forever. Um, the needles on conifer trees do die back, but they die back slowly and only in parts. So they won't shed all their needles at, at once with the exception of one tree, which we'll head back to in a moment. But the needles on the trees, farther back on the branch, those slowly turn brown and die off. Because when you have a bunch of branches over the top, the sunshine isn't hitting the needles that are really close to the trunk or farther back on the branch. And so the tree's like, bah, they're not really serving a purpose because the whole point is to soak up the sunshine to photosynthesize. But they cut their losses, they'll have some needles die back um, <clears throat> each year so that they can focus growth on the terminal end that is reaching out towards the sunshine so that they can be the most efficient uh, in terms of photosynthesizing. Other species of trees like the maples, the birches and whatnot, they do lose their leaves each winter and the, how long they last with foliage, that's going to depend on climate factors and whether or not we have um, an early winter or a late fall. So I hope that answered your question, Ruth. Okay. Eric is wondering if we are opening soon. So um, we are, of course, following the protocols set by New York State. And when we get the go ahead, we will consider our um, potential for reopening. And that is really the most information I can give you at this time. As all of you know who are watching the daily briefings, um, everything changes every minute. So just know that we are uh, coming up with new ways to serve you guys to ensure that you get your taste of the Adirondacks, whether it's at home or back here at the Wild Center in the future. Thank you for asking. All right, let's see. I know I had another one. Ah, Heather is wondering, is paper birch and white birch the same thing? It is. And so their, their names, the common names, can often be um, confused because it 
generally common names change from place to place. Like up here we call the tamaracks tamaracks, but they're known as Eastern Larch. So the reason why we use in science Latin names, which um, the paper birch and the white birch, interchangeable of course, um, is known as Betula papyrifera. It's not only a way to classify plants um, together and to look at how they are related to one another within groups of families, but also the uh, Latin name, the Latin binomial, makes for um, no mistakes. It's universal. Latin binomial is going to be used in forestry for the names of trees across the globe. So that kind of clears up some confusion when it comes to common names. Awesome. Thank you guys for all your questions and comments. Let's see. What trees, okay, Sean is wondering what trees there are, if any, that have edible features. Great question. So the white pine, the original one that I was talking about, this one behind me, does have um, edible qualities. The needles can be used to make a tea. And of course, before you guys go out and start picking plants and gobbling them up, be sure to do your research and identify because uh, you never necessarily know what's out there until you take a really close look and ensure what you're getting. So Eastern White Pine can make a nice bland needle tea, which is pretty yummy. And then I've also had the pleasure of trying White Pine Cambium Sugar Cookies. So kind of a mouthful. Cambium is a layer in the tree underneath the bark that can be scraped away, dried, and pounded into a flour. And so that cambium flour can be used in different baking goods. And I tell you, it is delicious. It doesn't taste the way that it smells, but it has a pretty nice fragrance and flavor to it. So there are some recipes out there, um, but a couple other trees, for example, um, are also have edible properties like the spruces, um, the white spruce, red spruce, and black spruce. Those needles can be used to make tea as well. And also, one of our other trees, the state tree of New York, the uh, sugar maple tree, is of course the most well known for the sap that it produces to make maple syrup. So that's probably the best known one out there, and I'd say the most delicious. So thank you everybody. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about some of our common Adirondack trees. I encourage you all to get out there, get outside. It's a beautiful day and go and explore. See if you can identify any of these trees that we saw today, like the white pine, the balsam fir, or the tamarack. And see if you can go ahead and take a picture, maybe share it with us and hashtag the wild center so you can see what you've got in your own backyards. Again, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to leave them in the comments comments and I'll be sure to get back to you after the live stream. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Stay safe out there and recreate local.